Everybody knows something about the story of Moses and the crossing of the Red Sea. Uh, I really liked this story when I was a kid. Moses, in fact, is one of my favorite characters in the Bible. Um, I think when I was little, what really struck me about this story is that Moses' mother put him in a basket and she put him in the tall grass along the Nile River. The Pharaoh's daughter came and found him, and basically her response to her father was, oh my God, he's so cute, can I keep him, can I keep him, can I keep him? And so the Pharaoh said, yeah, you can keep him. So he was raised as part of the royal uh, household. He was educated and treated very, very well. Had a very, very different life because the Pharaoh's daughter found him and brought him into, uh, into that part of the kingdom. Now, in religious science, what we do when we read the Bible is that, first of all, the Bible isn't something that takes place outside of you. When we look at stories in the Bible, we look at it because all of it takes place within us. All of the characters within us, all of the situations are something that we experience uh, at some point on our journey back to God. So I think this story will teach us deeply if we sort of open our minds and open our hearts to it. And ultimately, this story has three, three steps for how to be, um, I, guess, I guess they're really steps on how to be more successful. So I think the story shows us um, salvation from any condition of limitation or restriction through our right understanding of God as law. Now, Ernest Holmes teaches us that God is both love and law. Love is a presence that we court, and the law is a principle that we learn to work with intelligently. So very much the Old Testament is teaching us about our understanding of spiritual law. Now, this is really important because we have to get an, a, an understanding, a grasp on how to work with spiritual law before love and grace can come into the picture. This is why, actually, uh, in the evolution of consciousness on the face of the earth, why Buddha comes 500 years before Jesus, because Buddha brings the law which is preparing the collective consciousness for the next step, which is the loving grace. So back to the story. The children of Israel have been enslaved in Egypt for over 400 years. And Moses, who um, through a series of events, he uh, was in the wilderness for 40 years. He was given this assignment to go and lead them out of slavery. Right? So Moses was a timid guy. right? When God tells Moses, you're going to lead my people out of Egyptian bondage, Moses' response in so many words was, who, me? You must mean somebody else. See, Moses is not a person with a tremendous amount of self-confidence. Moses stutters. And so he doesn't want to get up in front of people and talk and say to everybody, hey, God's spoken to me. You all follow me. I'm going to get us out of here. He doesn't think that that's going to go very well. Um, so. Moses, though, the important thing is that it wasn't about the outer things. Moses had the consciousness that God was looking for to be able to do the job, that Moses had something on the inside. It wasn't about how he looked or how he spoke or any of that stuff on the outside. Now, Moses is the first person in the Bible who goes up to the mountain and made direct communion with God. So God gives Moses the extraordinary task of lead my people out of slavery to the promised land where everything will be provided for them. So the promised land, this is what really got me uh, right now because it's the end of the year and we're getting ready for a new year and I kind of feel like a lot of people do, like, okay, I'm really glad that 2018 is going to be over. You know, there are a lot of people I know had a very difficult 2018 and so nothing like a brand new slate to start the new year yeah, with a goal of arriving at the promised land. All right? So Moses' response you know, to God is like, who, me? You know? now, but the big key is that when he asks, out of what authority? Why are people going to listen to me? Why are they going to follow me? And he says, you know, by what authority? He says, by what authority shall I tell them I have come? You know, so Moses was an Israelite, but the first 40 years was raised as an Egyptian. He slew a man over a point of honor, and he fled the land. So he's in the wilderness for the next 40 years. 
Now he's ready for a new life. And the third 40 years will be leading the children of Israel through the wilderness to the promised land. So by what authority shall I tell them you have sent me? Tell them I am has sent me unto you. So God has revealed himself to Moses as I am that I am. So the Aramaic for this is I am the living God. Now remember, up at this point, all other gods were dead gods. They were inanimate. They were, um, they were stone. They were idols. That's what people worship. So there is something about the one God. In Science of Mind, we teach this idea that there's only one God, one principle, one power, one presence. And so Moses had instructions. Go to Pharaoh and tell the Pharaoh to let my people go. So he does, and of course the Pharaoh doesn't want to do this. Think about it. Slaves are clearly a huge part of the economy, all right? He's, you know, you want me to give up hundreds of thousands of slaves? Oh, sure, no problem, we'll figure that out, all right? So, so there is a series of plagues to show that God is serious. You know, it's your basic boils and locusts and frogs and things like that. But the last plague is that the firstborn of the Egyptians will die by the plague. And so Pharaoh, after this, Pharaoh lets the children of Israel go, but of course he changes his mind. He has a hard time letting go. Even though it's not going well, even though it's not working, even though there are a lot of trouble, there are a handful, he has a hard time letting go. Can you relate? I understand completely. It's not working. I'm choosing known hell over unknown heaven, but it's what I'm familiar with. That's what the Pharaoh's approach, so he wants those slaves back. So the Egyptians pursued after the children of Israel. Now remember, they have an army. They have horses. They have chariots. And the children of Israel see the Pharaoh's army, and they say to Moses, you have taken us away to die in the wilderness. You know, great. Look what you did. You took us away. We were better off before this, right? So they, there's no way for them to escape because one way is the army and the other way is the sea. So Moses says to the people, fear not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will perform for you this day. So the Lord shall fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. God says to Moses, tell them to go forward. Lift your hand and staff up over the sea. And the sea parts. And so they move forward. And then God says, lift your hand and staff again. And the sea closes in over the Pharaoh's army. Now Moses was in tune with the power of God. Now, God absolutely supports us in achieving our worthy spiritual objectives. We have to believe that. God is always for a greater expression of life, a greater expression of love, a greater expression of the spirit that we are. And so Moses' command deals with stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Uh, what, did sal what did salvation mean when it was spoken? Well, the Lord is the law of God operating in humankind. If God is mind, the law of mind is working in and through you and me. So God says, tell them I am has sent me. Anything we attach to our I am will come to pass. This is a great metaphysical truth. No one can speak that word for us. Think about it. Nobody can say I am for you, only you can pronounce an I am, right? But what word do you speak for yourself? Because whatever we add to I am gains power. Whatever we add to I am gains expression in our lives. So a lot of people say, oh, I'm not much, I'm stupid, I always goof things up, I'm always wrong, I'm not this, I'm not that, blah, blah, blah. Or we can say I am, I am enough, I am whole and perfect and complete as God created me. You know, so Moses is, is understanding of God as law. So Moses was, is important because he was the lawgiver to the nation of Israel. Now, this story, remember, is not about people outside of us. This story is about you. This story is about me. It deals with things we live and experience in life, and it tells us why we are confronted with something if we will go deep enough into it 
and what to do if our experience of it is not one that we want to be having. So Egypt is that state of consciousness that holds us in bondage, limitation, restriction. Like the Israelites, I think we are in bondage when our five senses are the only thing that's giving us any information about how we're doing in life. All right? See, that makes us a slave to conditions. The five senses make us a slave to external things around us. Ask yourself, you know, am I governed only by my five senses? If so, that's trouble. Remember, we are a metaphysical church, and being a metaphysical church, we are interested in what's beyond the five senses, what's beyond the physical. So God's law of mind action operating in us now says, let's get out of this Egyptian state of life. Right? and go to our promised land. The promised land is a better experience of life. And that's what I hold that 2019 offers to each and every one of us a better experience of life. It is available to everyone, you know? But, but do we want to make the trip? Do we want to make the effort? Right? See, that's the journey from sense consciousness to spiritual consciousness. And it's in spiritual consciousness where all good is provided. See, I think we all have a pharaoh in our mind, you know, uh, th th and that depends on the five senses. That depends on the five senses for the reality of life, right? The pharaoh within us is only looking by what we see and hear and feel and touch and taste. The children of Israel, though, are like the thoughts of mind that are seeking their way back to God, right? And so that salvation is just being saved from a condition of error. You know, there's lots of wilderness in the Bible. Moses is in the wilderness. Elijah's in the wilderness. Jesus goes to the wilderness. Clearly, it's a good place to pray. Uh, uh. But, you know, the wilderness, the wilderness is preparation for the promised land. In the wilderness, you don't have all the answers in their complete form yet. So 40 years of wandering in the wilderness is symbolic of the time it takes to do something, because numbers are important in the Bible. 40, 4, 400, whatever it is, is the time it takes to prepare to do something. It's the time it takes to prepare to create the consciousness so something can be accomplished. So when we face a real, a real sea in our life, a real red sea, and we don't know how we will get across it, I think we have to know absolutely that God is greater than anything we face. You know, if we've made mistakes and who among us has not, you know, salvation shows us that we can be redeemed from those mistakes. So the Lord spoke to Moses and Moses is something in you. Moses is something in me. Moses is something in us that's open to understanding God operates through law. And what I mean by that is that what you put out comes back that what goes around comes around, that what you focus on increases, right? That's the law. God is trying, I believe, to speak to you. And I think a, gr a great thing about Moses is he did not uh, love his people any less because they didn't understand him. He didn't love his people any less because uh, of who he was, or he didn't love his people any less because he had this very special connection to God. You know, there's nothing to feel other than the love. So, so the formula, I think, that comes out of this story, when we are faced with something, is the first thing is fear not. Fear not, right? Disclaim the fear. So you say, well, human, but I am afraid. I'm just terrified. I'm nervous. I'm this. I'm this. It's like, okay, but there is a place within you that is not afraid. There is an aspect of your consciousness, of your being, that is not afraid. Hold tight to that. Fear not. And you say, well, what would I say to myself? I say, well, you could say, in the name of God, be dissolved. In the name of God, fear be gone. In the name of God, fear be released. The next thing is stand still. See, I think when we're confronted with something, very often what we want to do is we want to get into the doing, because that feels like we're making progress, you know? I want to like row the boat and pedal the bicycle and, and just, just movement, because that feels like progress to me. But you know, 
Los Angeles is one of those places where you can see just because people are running really, really fast doesn't mean they're accomplishing very much. Right? So this is a very different approach. This is stand still. Center yourself in the silence. Right? Get quiet. Go within. Spirit, what do I need to know? Spirit, what do I need to do? Spirit, how do I need to be here? And the third one is see the salvation of the Lord. You have to envision the new state of experience in your heart. You know, see the salvation of the Lord. What's the desired outcome? What's the healing? And then it says, the Lord, the law, shall then fight for you. That God is going to do everything God can do on our behalf. So I have a little Sunday school story for you. And so... Uh, a kid comes home from church, and his parents say to him, so tell us, what did you learn in Sunday school today? He says, oh, we talked about Moses and the Red Sea. Oh, really? Moses and the Red Sea? Well, that's an interesting story. Tell us about that. And he says, well, Moses had to cross the Red Sea, so he, um, he got this pontoon boat. Yeah, pontoon boat, the great big pontoon boat, yeah. And the pharaoh had uh, fighter planes and bombs, you know, and there was this great battle that went on back and forth. His parents say, are you sure that's what you heard? I mean, really? Is that what they said? The little guy looks up and says, well, look, if you don't believe my story, there's no way you're going to believe what it says in the Bible. <laughs> Let's pray. So we turn our attention inward again for a moment to recognize that right here where we are, the fullness, the allness of God, God's spirit, God's love, God's light, it's right here. It surrounds us. It fills us. In fact, it's the most true, most real thing about each and every one of us. And so in this awareness, I claim for each and every one of us today that we are, we are filled with that very light, that very activity of God. It's the most true, most real thing about us. And so I speak the word that we fear not. Whatever is going on in our life, we fear not. We tell that fear to be dissolved and released in the name of God. And then we stand still. We allow ourselves to become quiet and introspective, moving into that silent place, knowing that everything we need to know is revealed. And we see the salvation of the Lord. We see our healing. We see our demonstration. We see the end result as we know it should be. And with all of that, we know that all of the universe is conspiring for our greater good, and we accept it. So we include in our prayer today our family members and friends, our parents and children, and we know right where they are, God is in its fullness. We let our prayer be a blessing in the world. So imagine emanating from your heart an energy of unconditional love that goes out into the world and touches all people, all situations, So we know that God is present in all of it, as love, as healing, as all needs met, as peace and reconciliation. We bless our church. We bless all churches everywhere. We bless synagogues and temples and mosques and ashrams, all paths to God. And I'm certain, I'm certain that we are blessed by being together, that there is raising up, that there is healing for all of us, and we say yes to it. So with a full heart, I give thanks that this is so. I release this word. And so it is. Together we all say, Amen. Amen.